afternoon or good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's Strengthening Families Networking Webinar. Today we're focusing on Parent Nation, the idea and the new book that is coming out soon. And I'm very excited to welcome our guests as well as a panel of members of our network who are gonna talk about the book. So this is gonna be an exciting conversation today. I'm really glad you're joining us all, or you're all joining us. <laughs> um, so just a quick orientation to these webinars. We do this each month. Um, it's an open invitation to anyone who's using the Strengthening Families Protective Factors Framework, coordinating Strengthening Families efforts, or just interested in how to help families. We jointly convene these between my organization, the Center for the Study of Social Policy, and the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. Each month we have a topic and guest speakers, and we are always welcome. Uh, we always welcome your su suggestions or folks to volunteer to share something. And we do post the recordings and materials from past webinars. There's a very rich archive of about 12 years worth of these webinars at the link you see there. I will put that in the chat as well uh, when I'm done talking. So upcoming webinars, just so you know, we always do this on the second Thursday of the month. It's always at this time, three o'clock Eastern. Uh, most times we do it for an hour. Today is gonna be an hour and a half. So we have a nice time for a rich discussion. On May 12th, we'll do an hour long webinar focusing on mutual reciprocity and equity as a catalyst for community transformation with some of our partners from Be Strong Families presenting. And I'm very excited for that topic as well. You can mark the second Thursday of the month uh, on your calendar and uh, join when the topic is relevant for you, but those are the dates coming up. We'll announce the topics as they get closer. All right, so I'm very excited that today we're going to hear about Parent Nation and the Parent Nation campaign. I'll introduce our speakers in a moment. When they're done talking, we're gonna have a panel discussion which will be moderated by Maureen Holliker from the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. And then I and Maureen will each share some updates from our organizations to wrap us up. We'll have time for Q&A um, after the panel discussion, but you can type in questions at any point, um, either in the chat or really if it's a question that you're hoping one of the presenters or panelists will answer, you should put it in the Q&A function so that we definitely see it. Sometimes that chat can fly right by. So um, I'm very excited to welcome our speakers today. Um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen while we transition over to the presenters, but we are very, very honored to be joined today by Dr. Dana Suskin, who is, <laughs> I find my actual um, notes, there we go. <laughs> I don't want to get your introduction wrong. Dana Suskin, MD, is the co-director of the TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health at the University of Chicago. She's a professor of surgery and pediatrics and director of the Pediatric Cochlear Implant Program. Her clinical work focuses on pediatric cochlear implantation, and her research focuses on optimizing children's foundational brain development and preventing early cognitive disparities and their lifelong impact. She's the author of the book, 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain, and a forthcoming book, Parent Nation, which empowers parents to use developmental neuroscience to build a society that works for families, not against them. And she's joined today by Yoli Flores. Yoli Flores is National Campaign Director for Parent Nation, where she's leading strategic efforts to activate parents and allies in building a parent nation. Previously at the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, Yoli led efforts to support over 300 campaign communities to ensure early school success <clears throat> for more children by elevating parent success. As a leader in Los Angeles, she's been Vice President of the Board of Education and CEO of the LA County Children's Planning Council, the nation's largest children's collaborative, focused on improving outcomes for children. Yoli's 30-year career advancing the well-being of children and families has earned her the distinction of twice being named Social Worker of the Year. Yoli is also a longtime friend of CSSP and Strengthening Families, and we're thrilled to have her and Dr. Suskin with us today. I also want to remind you that many of you, <clears throat> when you registered for the webinar, were able to also claim a free book, a free copy of Parent Nation, which will come out at the end of the month. That is thanks to the generosity of the Obercotter Hearing First Foundation. And we're really happy that we were able to help many of you get copies of the book. And I hope that those of you who didn't get it through that way will find another way <laughs> to get that book when it comes out. So with that, I'm gonna hand off to Dana and Yoli and excited to hear your presentation. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, it is an absolute thrill to be here. I'm gonna start off by opening up my slides. Um, you know, I 
cannot tell you how excited I am to be here with so many of you all. Uh, I'm a great admirer of all the organizations. Caitlin, thank you for bringing us all together um, uh, through the Strengthening Families Network. Uh, my only wish is that we could be here in person, but uh, as I said, this is much better than nothing. Um, but even remotely, I am just thrilled to be talking about, you know, what what we need to do to push forward this country. Uh, this is work that you all have been doing for a long time. Um, and we just need to get the rest of the nation uh, on board. Um, I want to extend my gratitude to the Strengthening Families framework and the impact that it has had across the country. Uh, it is just remarkable. Um, and, you know, our work there's no doubt that the work that we're pushing forward on all fronts is so incredibly aligned. Um, and I'm excited for you to hear uh, from Yoli uh, about the parent villages in this national campaign, uh, which lifts up really two of the protective factors uh, that you all talk about so often, you know, social connection and building resilience. And uh, I know you'll enjoy so much really what's what what we're pushing out and what we hope to partner with. Um, and I really hope that this can be lead to not just deep partnership, but um, that we can be in service of you all because everything that you're doing is so aligned. And for those of you who, when you get the book, actually read it, and I expect everyone to read it, um, you will see the work that so many of you all do between between the covers, uh, the work of, this, of CSSP and the different projects um, um, are throughout uh, the book uh, and serve as inspiration for hopefully the you know all those who read it outside the echo chamber because the truth is we all know what needs to happen in this country we just need the political will and the public will to push it forward but I figured you know what I'll give you a very short overview of who I am how this book came to be and then really turn it over to Yoli um, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, I am a physician, um, but I don't expect anybody to call me Dr. Suskin unless you want a surgery. Um, but it is true that my natural habitat is not Zoom, although it's becoming that. Um, believe it or not, I feel most comfortable in the operating room um, because my day job is as a pediatric cochlear implant surgeon. And as a physician who works just millimeters from the brain, uh, I have no room for error. When I step into that operating room, it's critical that I have my necessary tools at my disposal. And most importantly, my A-team. Otherwise, my job is impossible. Now, I'm going to argue something that may sound like a bit of a stretch, but I would argue that the challenges of successfully rearing children is really not so different. I'd even posit that Raising a child is quite a bit more complicated. To raise a child into a happy, healthy adult uh, capable of achieving their full potentials, what do you need? You need adequate information, you need an appropriate safe environment, and you need backup. But far, for far too many parents, they are operating or really parenting in not an optimal environment. We know this so well. For far too many parents in our country and throughout the world, it's as if they're trying to function in the midst of an endless power failure, asked to achieve a goal without necessary tools or any backup, and it is just not sustainable. But you're probably wondering, okay, this is great, but why exactly is a surgeon up here in the first place? Let me take a, just a step back to tell you a little bit about how I got here and why it may make sense. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I became one because I thought I could change lives one child at a time. By implanting a child born deaf, I give them the ability to hear, to access sound, and to spoken language. But early in my practice, I noticed profound differences in my patients' outcomes after surgery. Some children excel developmentally, others not at all. Some learned to talk, others did not. The ability to hear, it turned out, didn't always translate into unlocking their full capacity to learn and thrive intellectually. It was an incredibly painful difference to see and really compelled to figure out the origins of these differences and more importantly, what I could do about it and best help my patients. I began a journey far outside the operating room into the world of social sciences. 
It was initially inspired by research that found a stark difference in the amount of language, the actual number of words that children were exposed to early in life. And you all know this research. Researchers calculated by the end of the time of a by the time a child reached their fourth birthday, there would be roughly a difference of 30 million words between those who had heard a lot of language and those who heard very little. As I learned more, I realized that what I was seeing in my deaf patients really just mirrored the population at large. In all children, the differences in early language exposure correlate to later differences in achievement. Some of my patients were getting that essential type of experience with language, others were not. Look, the research that inspired me wasn't perfect, far from it, but it was persuasive enough to pull me, a surgeon, from the operating room. It gave me a critical place to start. I think honestly right now about the 30 million word study is just a first sentence in what has become an extensive body of literature, a body of literature that includes cutting edge research that the reveals the way in which language input stimulates every part of an infant's brain. And the fact that the quantity of words is far from the only important input, quality and delivery are tremendously important. Nurturing back and forth conversation with a loving caregiver are especially powerful and effective at building secure neuronal foundations that will serve a child throughout its lifetime. That and protection from toxic stress are the key. In 2010, when I launched the 30 Million Words Initiative, now the TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health, my primary goal was to help ensure the healthy development in all children and to give every child the ability to reach his or her potential intellectually and emotionally. Brain science pointed the way. Everything that we designed was based on the fact that nurturing talk and interaction between a caregiver and infant lay the foundation for brain development. I want to emphasize that it is and always has been about the power of parents. My team and I developed evidence-based programs and strategies that show parents the impact of talking to babies and young children. Those strategies became the theme of TMW. Tune in, talk more, take turns, or what we call the three T's. I often joke that that's going to be on my epitaph. We demonstrated that rich conversations is what children need to unlock their potential, and that parents and as well as other loving caregivers hold the key during the early years. All adults, no matter their level of education, wealth, or work, can master the essential techniques for optimally building a child's brain. The idea, a straightforward approach to a complex problem, was initially was, was intuitively appealing and a great success. I think that many had hoped it would be a silver bullet. But of course, we all know there are no silver bullets. But I was proud to share the three T's with many families through the TMW Center programs and through my first book, 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain. My colleagues and I at the TMW Center conducted numerous rigorous studies of our programs. We found that indeed our strategies worked and the science that supports them is solid. The programs we promote can and often do improve the lives of children. But in truth, as our program, research program took us into more and more families' homes and into their lives, I realized just how much was being asked of parents. Parents everywhere were being asked to operate without their A team. Because our studies followed fam children from their first day of life into kindergarten, my team and I were getting to know these families up close and over time. The parents' enthusiasm was thrilling. They embraced those three T's with gusto. The problem was, though, those three T's only took parents so far. Real life would intrude again and again and again. There was Randy, who loved the fact that his ability to talk about baseball could help his son learn math but had to work two jobs and most days had less than 30 minutes with his kids. There was Sabrina who gave up a well-paying job to care for her husband when he got sick and whose family ended up in a homeless shelter, spending 
over two years in a stressful and chaotic environment with her youngest one still a baby. There was Michael and Kiana, whose life was upended when he was incarcerated for a crime he did not commit and sat in jail for five years, those five critical years, while he was awaiting trial that quickly exonerated him. Reflecting on what I was seeing, I began to look beyond my patients and the predominantly low-income families who were participating in TMW programs to the entirety of tens of millions of parents in the United States who have children. And I saw, regardless of income level, far too many parents are being sidelined by some degree by our nation's unfamily friendly policies. I wanna be clear, this is not to minimize the Herculean struggles of poor families or to suggest that more affluent families face equivalent challenges. There is no equivalency, full stop. But nonetheless, it remains true that American society has abdicated its responsibility for all families. This, of course, became painfully apparent as COVID-19 left families reeling, millions forced to scrape by with, not, with that, no backup whatsoever. The pandemic was like a powerful earthquake with lingering aftershocks that showed us just how shaky our nation's infrastructure of supports for parents and therefore children really was and still is. The bottom line is we've made it difficult for all parents to raise children in our country and almost impossible for some. I'm gonna show you a few slides that you all know so well, but just to hammer home just how little we do. We in the United States are the only one of 38 OECD countries not to mandate paid parental leave. And while we all intuitively understand how challenging this is from a parent's perspective, the fact that one in four parents' mothers go back to work within two weeks of giving birth, recent research shows the impact on neural functioning of babies whose parents lack unpaid leave. We know in generalities that in our country, we spend less on early child care and education than any other developed nation. But I think this slide shows just how stark those differences are. We don't need to be Norway at $29,000 per year spent on child care for toddlers. Even the median would be fine. The average being for all these countries, $14,000 per year. But I want you to direct your eyes to the very bottom of this chart and see exactly where we stand. The country with the largest GDP of all the nations in the world, we spend $500 per year per child. Given all of this, it's not exactly surprising that the U.S. differs from other countries on another important measure, something we don't talk as much about as we should, parental happiness. Now, I want to make clear, in most advanced nations, parents report lower levels of happiness than non-parents. This is not to say that we don't love our children, but look, raising children is hard work. But in a study of 22 OECD, na OECD nations led by Jennifer Glass and colleagues, she found that the gap between parents and non-parents and their happiness correlated with the family leave policies, with more generous family leave policies resulting in a smaller gap. I want you once again to direct your eyes to the very bottom of this chart. Can you guess who has the largest gap between parents and non-parents in terms of happiness? Yes, it's our country once again. Put simply, parents in this country lack support and they lack choices. No matter their political or religious orientation, employment or educational status, too many parents seem to be struggling. So as I reflected on all of this, I began writing my next book right at the beginning of COVID when I was holed up with my eight amazing kids. I knew that the world didn't need another how-to book about what parents can do to help their children, though I promise you my publisher would have absolutely loved it. Instead, I thought perhaps a book that can show us how the brain science can inform a society that works for parents, not against them, that could help shift the narrative and the burdens that so many parents carry. I named this book Parent Nation 
But I want to be clear. When I say parent, I don't just mean biologic parents. I mean aunts, uncles, step parents, early child care providers, pediatricians, really anyone who loves and cares for a child or cares for the future of our country. And as I was writing, I spoke to dozens of parents from all walks of life. And I was struck time and time again, despite what the narrative says, just how much they shared in common. Even parents who seemed like they had nothing in common on the surface told me stories and shared thoughts and concerns and fears that were incredibly similar to one another. Though their circumstances differed wildly, the fact that they were struggling to parent in the way, in the way they wanted to, in the way they knew best for their children, that was a universal. You know, we talk a lot about parental choice in this country. It's considered sacrosanct, as it should be. But really, what does choice mean when there are no options to be had? So you may ask, how did exactly did we wind up where we are today? With a status quo that leaves parents struggling and unhappy, a status quo that is totally void of a systemic approach to helping parents meet their children's needs. A status quo that I want to emphasize is so different than any other nation in the world that, that is investing in the future. The explanation is complex and multifaceted, but one consistent theme runs throughout the choices we've made as a society. This mythic idea of American individualism, the notion that Americans have to be tough and independent, prevails and it perpetuates this going it alone as a virtuous ideal. This result has to be convinced has been to convince parents that they should be able to shoulder this enormous responsibility for early child care and development on their own without supports. As parents, we, especially moms, all of us, have internalized this propaganda, often burdened by guilt, managing a delicate balancing act, struggling to make it work, yet feeling totally inadequate and unable to live up to the ideals we should imagine that we should be achieving often asking why we are failing rather than asking why the system has failed us. The bottom line is I've come to realize we don't have any expectations that society should and can play a role. Indeed, expecting societal support is often seen as a form of weakness, an admission of failure, and this must change. So we suffer alone, but we also suffer collectively when the ultimate intellectual development of a child is hampered. We all lose. So how to go forward? This comes back to my own roots as a pediatric physician and a neuroscientist. I believe that neuroscience can give us a roadmap. Just as it tells us how to prioritize individually as parents, it can show us where to go societally as well. It can lay the coordinates that will lead us towards healthy brain development for all children. Neuroscience tells us that we must begin when learning begins, not on the first day of school, but the first day of life. It tells us that children's earliest and most impactful brain architects are their parents and early child care providers. And it tells us that environment matters. Stable, calm environment fosters socio-emotional and executive function. Disruptive environment impedes it. And what do parents need in order to follow the roadmap provided by neuroscience? What does society need to know? Look, loving mothers and fathers don't need PhDs. They don't need expensive gadgets to do an excellent job at supporting early brain development. What do they need? They need access to basic but critical knowledge on how to best foster neural connections. They need time with their children to put that knowledge into practice and nurture those connections. They need high quality childcare who, with child care providers paid a living wage that complements their efforts, and they need to provide their children with stress-free homes. And critically, they need support for this endeavor from employers, from health care, from communities and policymakers. We could go over and over all the different policies that could be in a parent nation, but I think we all know it. And I really, I, I, I really want to move forward with how do we move forward? How do we create a society that puts families and parent, parents and children at its center? 
I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and this really ties into so much of what CSSP and all of you all are doing across the nation. I we need to harness the power of parent voice, but how to it? How do we do it? In truth, we look, need to look no further than our nation's own recent path to see how a group of formerly isolated individuals banded together to achieve lasting and important change. In truth, in the mid 20th centuries, America in 20th century, Americans over 65 years of age were the poorest, most underserved segment of our population. It, it wasn't children like it is today. In addition to having limited retirement savings, older Americans uh, face crippling health care and housing costs. According to a government study at that time, 50% of the elderly existed below the minimum standards of decency. The AARP changed all of that. Thanks to the AARP, over the last 50 years, there is no age group served better by society and government than the elderly. The poverty rate among Americans over 65 and older declined by almost 70 percent. Now, could you imagine that in our pediatric, in our child population? What a dream. By 70 percent, they decreased their poverty rate. The AARP continues to make advances in health care, prescription drug costs, long-term care, and more. And importantly, they unite constituents across socioeconomic, political, racial, and ethnic divides by focusing on the benefits, the rights that benefit everyone and their success is legendary. They are, believe it or not, one third Democrat, one third Republican, one third independent. Just as our nation's seniors were in desperate need and entirely deserving of support decades ago, so too, so too are parents of young children today. We need more, we should demand more of our society. But where do we start? How do we move forward? As important as we, as, as important as what we fight for is how we go about fighting as a united front of parents and allies working together who recognize themselves and one another and who refuse the very notion that a child can be someone else. Which is why we are so thrilled to be talking to you today. Um, I, at this point, I'm going to be turning it over to Yoli, but I always joke that as a surgeon, you never want to leave anything to chance. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the ideas that we are all fighting for manifested in the way that, that I hoped uh, they would in this world. And it is my hope that this, this campaign in conjunction with the book can help shift the public will in favor of championing families and giving all children opportunity to thrive. I hope that we can break through this, out of this echo chamber and break through the noise of this country so that we finally start supporting children and families. And at this point, I want to turn over uh, the podium to, you're not Yoli, to, Yo, to, to Samantha. Oh, there we go, Yoli. So thank you so much Hi. for listening and I will turn it over. Thank you, Dana, and <clears throat> hello to all of you. It's so wonderful to be back with this network um, and uh, to reconnect with CSSP. I'm actually also a former board member of CSSP and um, hold this organization and this network in my heart um, just for the work that you do for the, uh, the amazing impact that CSSP has had in the lives of children and families in this nation, um, including the work of strengthening families and the protective factor. So thank you for having um, both me and Dana on with you to share about Parent Nation. I now have the opportunity to share with you um, a little bit about the campaign, really building on everything that you've heard from Dana just now. And our, our greatest hope is to take the power of what's in the book. And some of you I know have read it. I know our panelists have. Um, and when you have an opportunity to read it, you will just see how incredibly powerful it is. It is a an inspiring call to action that I know is so aligned with everything that you all, we all do and think and embrace in this country on behalf of children and families. So uh, the campaign, uh, will uh, really leverage the book and um, 
and help us build on not just what's in the book, but this big idea that parents deserve a society that supports them so that all children can be successful. So what's the campaign? Let me share it with you because what we want is for you to be part of it in any way um, that you want and can. I'm gonna pull up my slides and walk you through both the communication, social media, social impact campaign. I'm sorry, you're seeing all of my crazy things here. There we go. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the uh, air game, if you will, it's our social impact campaign. It's how we will um, utilize existing and new messaging that will hopefully inspire and move us toward this ideal of a parent nation. So just a couple of things, I'm gonna show you some uh, very brief sneak peek videos that you'll get to see and start hearing about when we launch on April 26th. So in the beginning of our social impact campaign, we're really gonna kick off with um, some campaign clips of new segments. We've partnered with an incredible creative agency called Matter Unlimited. And they have developed a public messaging campaign that really illustrates what a parent nation looks like. The campaign will highlight real life moments of support and solidarity, you know, that some of which have captured the public's attention, but that illustrate that in a parent nation, these moments will be the norm. And let me give you a sneak peek into what we mean by that. So I'm gonna show you these three videos and it captures that idea of showing just what it could be if we lived in a, in a parent nation. And some of these will be familiar to you because you might've seen these, especially this first one with J.D. Pryor. Um, this is an adorable video, it came out, I think it was in the early part of 2020. Um, we're thrilled, watch this. Did you understand it though? No. What our nation has, lots of devoted parents. What our nation needs, better ways to support them. Like paid leave for the early days that go too fast. The potential of children depends on support for their parents. It takes a nation, a parent nation. This is the next one. Oh my God, they're adorable. So brave. They are, aren't they? What our nation has? Lots of devoted parents. What our nation needs? Better ways to support them. Like flexible work schedules for moments you can't redo. The potential of children depends on support for their parents. It takes a nation, a parent nation. And the last one I'll show you is this one. Do you like your room? Yeah! What our nation has? Lots of devoted parents. What our nation needs, better ways to support them. Like affordable housing for the security kids need. The potential of children depends on support for their parents. It takes a nation, a parent nation. So that's just a little sneak peek of some of the messaging that we'll see uh, starting the week of April 26th. Um, and by the way, we do have a communication toolkit. We would love for you to help us amplify these messages, push them out. Um, and if you're interested in that, we'll make sure you, uh, we tell you how to contact us. So the messaging will also include some of the pain points that Dana talked about, whether it's about the very little or, or little percentage of parents that have access to paid leave or the fact that we live in a nation where child early access to early childhood is simply not available and if it is our providers are in the lowest paid jobs in this country 
So both elevating the beauty of what a parent nation could be, the consequences of not, some of the pain points, all of that will be in our messaging. So I wanna talk now about um, how we intend um, to bring the message to community. So it's the, our on the ground activation strategy and on the ground activation effort. And in talking to Kaylin, we were really looking at all of the ways in which this idea of parent villages that I'll talk to you about in a second is so aligned to the protective factors. And I wanna show you and tell you about that. So as we were thinking about how we activate the people with the most moral authority on this issue, which is parents and caregivers, we began to think about what could bring parents together in community. And um, from that developed this idea of parent villages and have developed a set of tools and resources, a curriculum, a toolkit to bring small groups of parents together in community. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that is in a minute. But the intent here of bringing parents together in community through parent villages are threefold. One is the idea of fostering community. Fostering community is what builds and, um, and fosters social connections. It's what builds resilience, but also the idea of forging collective identity. And as Dana said earlier, elevating our, our expectations of society, helping parents see that asking for support uh, is rather than um, a sign of weakness, it's a form of commitment to what we aspire for for our children, um, for us to get to the hopes and dreams that we promised them. And, and the idea of forging collective identity is to help parents see that all parents love their children and that all parents deserve support. And that it's through that unity, that thing that connects us all that can help us build a powerful voice on behalf of parents. And then finally, this idea of inspiring parents to fight for change. Parents, caregivers, allies, all of us really pushing for that ideal of a parent nation. And the way that we went about creating parent villages, the curriculum, the content, was starting by honoring and respecting the role of parents. We developed a set of parent ideals, a set of foundational principles that all align to what we believe is right and appropriate about parents, that all parents deserve support, that all parents love their children. And all of what we did was really use a strength-based approach. So what does that look like? The curriculum is a four 90-minute session each curriculum. I'm going to walk you through what that looks like in a second. It's available in English and Spanish, and it's for bringing parents together either in person or virtually. I think we've all come to the conclusion that although we may be close to getting back to some form of normalcy where we can be together in person, that actually convening in a virtual way is helpful um, is better suited for some parents who may not be able to for childcare or other reasons, or it's just more convenient. So we've developed this, this uh, approach of building parent villages together, uh, both in person and through this kind of a platform, through Zoom or some other form. The, the curriculum in each of the sessions was developed um, in a way that we knew it could be interacting and engaging. We wanted to make sure that it would be adaptable and modular, meaning that if you're an organization that already brings parents together through either parent leadership, parent education, parent advocacy, and you want to build in what we've developed and add it to what you're doing, that's completely fine. Maybe you just like what's in session two and in session three, and you can just build those into what you're already doing. The uh, materials are all part of a kit that's available to anybody who would like to host and bring together a parent village group. All of the content will be available by download at no cost. We've also just uh, partnered with FedEx to make all of the uh, uh, tools, all of the resources available through them. They will print for you at their cost. Actually, they really reduced it for us. Um, and then we'll deliver it free to your local FedEx uh, if you're within a 30 mile radius. 
And then we wanted to make sure that you felt this was also yours, your tool. So you could co-brand, you could add your organization's logo and make it so that it's available to parents who know you, trust you, and can see that you're part of this effort. So what do these four sessions look like? I'm gonna give you just a brief overview. We are doing information sessions for those of you who want to know more, go deeply into each of the sessions, walk through the curriculum. But just to give you a little highlight, in session one, the idea here, of course, because it's the first time parents may be coming together, they may not know each other, it's the beginning of fostering community. They'll start to learn about this idea of a parent nation, of a society that should be supporting families much more intentionally and concretely. They'll be experiencing that this village, this space is a place of support where they can learn from one another, listen and feel heard. And then, and this is the part that is so aligned to the protective factors, they'll begin to explore a set of principles which we actually developed with parents. Principles that honor all parents as they begin to let go of the pressure that they have to be perfect, that they have to do this alone. The second session is the beginning of forging collective identity and more importantly, the idea of elevating our expectations of society. In session two, there are two activities. As I said earlier, this is all very activity-based. In session two, they will uh, move into an activity called the building blocks activity. And then in the second part of the session, they'll um, engage in an activity called the big shift. The building blocks activities, there's a set of cards and parents will begin to imagine, they go through a set of scenarios that are written in the card, scenarios that are very typical to most parents. And uh, on the back of the card is how uh, that scenario could be addressed by an employer, by government, by community, if we lived in a society that truly supports parents. So for example, many parents uh, in their workplace are often asked to change their work schedules to instead of leaving at five to stay until six, seven, but childcare ends at five or six and you have nowhere else to go. So how do you manage that? Um, and in the back of the card, there are different ways that we can begin to see how that could be addressed if we lived in a society that better supported parents. The second part of session two is the big shift. And in the big shift, parents will have, um, by looking at a poster, um, a balance, a scale. On each side of the scale um, are who it is that meets the primary needs of parents. They will begin to identify five core needs, paid family leave, child care, financial support, housing, all of the things that are so critical, and identify where on that scale that need gets met. Whether on one side it's an individual endeavor or on the right side, whether it's an institution that's supporting you. They put all their stickies and then they do this again on another scale that's called the, our ideal society. And there they put their sticky on what would it look like in an ideal society that truly supported parents. And what happens in this session, it becomes powerfully visible how out of balance um, we are in this country, how much is really on the shoulders of families, mostly alone, but how it could be if we reimagine the society that we deserve. In session three, parents begin to explore this idea of being a change maker. We wanted to dispel the myth that to be a change maker, you need to be this articulate, charismatic public speaker with a lot of connections and show that any, all of us, we have strengths and talents and interests that we can align to any kind of social change agenda. There's also part of this activity is a speed dating game. So they get to learn from each other, the role that they identify with. Um, and we really use the social change literature to talk about certain roles, the helper, the advocate, the organizer, the rebel. And then we added a fifth which is a storyteller. 
So through this activity, parents begin to see how their interests, their talents align to one or more of these roles and learn about other people, other parents who have made change by being in one of those roles. And then finally in session four, this is the last session it's where it all comes together. In session four, we start off with the bingo game. The bingo game really allows parents to learn about key concepts. This is another alignment to protective factors, which is around knowledge of parenting and child development and key concepts. They'll learn about historical efforts of times in our society when we got so close to passing legislation that would have significantly improved the lives of children and families, all to be vetoed by a president. Or historical moments where we had some victories. We also have some bright spots of change makers on this bingo again so that parents can see themselves as change makers. And then in the second and last part of the session, which is the ending, they start to develop their village action plan. And they've taken everything they've learned, the idea that they could be a change maker, this concept that we, we absolutely have every right to expect society to support in raising the next generation. They begin thinking about their action plan and then end by taking a pledge to do whatever they can, big or small, to achieve their ideal parent nation. We've tested the curriculum over an eight month period across the country. Some of you might have been part of this effort. Um, these are all of the groups that over the six to eight months brought parents together, hosted a parent village, gave us feedback on every one of the sessions. Some were in English, some were in Spanish. Three of them were virtual, so we tested all the virtual tools. Two of them were in person. And it's really through the hearing constantly, the voice of parents, what resonated, what was missing, that we feel so excited and confident that we have a tool and a set of resources to share with you that will inspire parents, that would help them see their power in making change on behalf of their children. I'm gonna skip this for a second, but I'll come back to that. Here's just an example of that big shift activity. We tested this in Baltimore at the Parents' as Teachers Conference. And on the, on the left, you'll see in their current life how their needs get met. It's mostly on the individual side. And then when they do it again, of course it's gonna shift. But what is so powerful in this activity is the conversation that parents have about what that means and what more they could do and could do if they had more time, if they had more support to help their children reach their hopes and dreams. I have a lot more to share, but I know we want to get to the panel. We do have ongoing information sessions um, to go deeper, to show you all of the material. I was going to show you some of it now, but maybe if we get through q and I'll come back to that. But just know that we're here to support you, to partner with you, to give you these tools, and to hopefully together build a parent nation. Yoli, thank you so much. And Dana, thank you so much. Um, truly, yes, an inspiring call to action. And um, before we started the call, I was telling um, Dr. Suskin that I was going through the book and being like, yes, yes, every page. So I know that when you all get this, you'll be highlighting and, and doing the same thing. So thank you so much. So we have put together a fantastic panel for you. I'm going to introduce them and then we will um, ask some questions. We have about 30 minutes for the panel discussion. So with us, we have Deborah Chosewood, who is the Deputy Director of Prevention and Community Support in Georgia the Division of Children and Family Services. So that's Georgia's Children's Trust Fund and Strengthening Families. Um, Co-state lead for Georgia Reads events. So Deborah, give everyone a wave there. And we have uh, Fatima Gonzalez Galindo, a parent activist from Washington, um, Washington Strengthening Families State Community um, Cafe lead and a collaborative member a former member of the Parent Advisory Council of the Children's Trust Fund Alliance, and a former member of Friends Parents Advisory Council. Fatima, you wanna give everyone a wave there? 
Excellent. And we also have um, Samantha Moore Valentine, a professor um, and part of the Georgia Parent Advisory Council, Region 7. Um, it's prevention and community support. Again, D Georgia Division of Children and Family Services, easy for me to say. Uh, Leadership Council, Outreach Committee Co-Chair, Strengthening Families Georgia, Cross-Agency Family um, Council, peer, uh, Family Peer Ambassador, and Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning. So, Samantha, give everyone a wave if you're there. Yeah, I see you. Um, and uh, Jennifer Lee Stein, who is the Director of Parent, uh, Prevent Child Abuse Georgia. Jennifer, are you out there? There you are. So welcome to all of the panelists. Thank you so much um, for volunteering to be on the panel. We had the opportunity to read the book in advance and you just heard Dr. Suskin's presentation about the book. I'd like to start by asking Fatima and Samantha, uh, since you are both here as parent leaders and connecting with a lot of other parents, in your communities, what do you find most exciting about the parent nation? Fatima, you want to? Okay, I can go first. Well, the first thing I can say, um, I when I started reading the book and I reflected myself with the stories, is how my life is there, my mom's life is there. So it was a lot of like, this is real. It's not just made to believe, you know, a story. So it was good for me to see that. And the second part is, that, um, as, as I was reading the book, it, many questions came to me and I was excited to see everything and put it, it other thing that was exciting is that even if there's a lot of, uh, you know, like a doctor's view stuff, you know, the brain development, it was easy to digest for me. It was easy to read. It was easy to understand everything. So I can put two and two together. Um, many things just came back to me more like questions and it's like this, like that, which I think it was great because when people read that, they can make impact in our community, on our parent nation. So uh, one of the things that I, um, you know, when you talk about all this uh, community members coming together, providers, parents, uh, to do our best that, that we can to uh, make the children uh, reach the full pot pot potential, uh, it, made, it made me think about having like one shop stop, uh, like a center, a doctor clinic, where they will have all the resources where we as a parents can go and have all those resources that we need after we do a little, I love the sticky notes, it's a visual for me. So, you know, after I did all my uh, homework and I said, this is what I'm missing, and this is why I need extra help, then, um, you know, I take my kids to the doctor, it would be easy for me to go there and get all those resources right there at the same uh, place. Other thing that made me think a lot, it was about childcare, you know, how, I'm from Mexico, you know, I always say that, how can in Mexico we can get, you know, maternity leave in here? I didn't have that, uh, you know, it's like, oh, now um, it, it also made me think that every right seems a fight. So everything that we, is a right for us as a parents and for children, we have to fight for it. So here in the state of Washington now, we have a maternity, paternity leave, and it took, it took years to get to that, you know, people going back and forth and, and when I say fighting, it's more like a negotiation, you know, uh, to get what uh, what we got now. And so parents can get maternity and uh, maternity and paternity leave, but it still is not easy. It's a process. It's not like okay, I'm having a baby and then I'm taking three months off. No, it's a process of putting papers together, submit it anyhow. So it needs to uh, to get it fixed. So um, other thing that uh, made me think is. Um, I have my little notes. Uh, when I read um, that, it's like, like I said, I, my life was on, in your book. Fatima was there. When were you talking about, you know, leaving the, your job because it was not, the childcare was not affordable. So I did that. And it was not just because the money, but also my mental and emotional health. I was, you know, when having my baby somewhere, it was hard, especially, you know, a few months old. So, uh, and so I just kind of like, yeah, we need to have um, across the, the country a maternity leave 
for as long as we need it. I know other countries that you were pointing out, you know, they have more than three months. They have, I guess one, if I read somewhere like a year in Europe, you know, it's like, wow, that's amazing. Um, other thing that made me, uh, when I was reading it, and I was excited again about it is when, excited and sad at the same time, when we are talking about the percentage of the uh, speech delays, you know, how high it is. And I was thinking about second language people, uh, kids. And that is a fight too. When you go to the doctors and you express your concerns about your child being delayed and, uh, and your language, they is always oh, because I learned two languages. You know, it's like, and so many times it's not like that. As a parent, you know, you know, when something not clicking with your child. So all those things just made me um, think about other things. And I think that um, if that brings questions to people when they're reading it, it's good because you just start, you're going to start making changes. And, and when we're making changes, it will be better for us as a parents and for our children. Thank you so much for your thoughts on that. Um, I see a lot of nodding heads on the panel, and I'm sure out there in the audience, there's lots of nodding heads too. So thank you. Samantha, what, what were your thoughts about Parent Nation? Well, as I, first, I want to say thank you for um, being able to be here today with you all. Um, as I was reading this book, the first thing that came to mind was, what is your why? You know, it immediately captured my interest because we read books all the time and we don't know the background of the author. But the fact that up front, right out the gate, you hear, I'm a medical expert. That means you're capturing and captivating audiences that want to hear what a medical expert has to say. But then it took a turn. And that is what really was like, wait a second. This is not the same as any other piece of literature that I have read. This is an in-depth um, point of view that is something that even as an educator and a parent, I felt myself go through every emotion as the answers to questions were coming up, they were being answered. So at one point I went, wait a second, I know exactly how um, a phonemic awareness, literacy, okay, so when are we gonna get to the point about the parents? Then automatically it was addressed. So it captivated every question that I had, there was an answer. And the key point was starting point. Um, one thing that stood out was it said, regardless of income level, parents are being sidelined by our country's lack of family friendly policies, despite a culture that champions family values. Our society is not centered on families. Wait a second. How many books have you read lately that put it out there so blatantly? You know, we say it in parent cafes. We say it amongst our, ourselves as colleagues in our private discussions. However, have you seen it put in print? So it was like, okay, I, I, I really enjoyed the fact that it was the first time, um, the year 2022 is the first time where I'm starting to see social institutions, the family social institutions, economic, political, government, education, religious, communities um, and systems and the medical community coming together and taking a stand. Everything that um, we learn on a daily basis, some of them are separated. But the fact that in 2022, all of these systems that are responsible for change are saying the same thing, it has me excited. It lit a fire. And there's a light at the end of that tunnel that now with collaboration, of each system and evidence-based research programs, we can do more than just ask. We can show the need and we can now say, hey, I have a medical expert that is saying we need this. I have law enforcement saying we need this. I now have policies and laws and medical research that will be backed with the demand. So for me, um, each of the testimonies supported by medical research, um, it, it captured the attention of all. One thing I must say that really um, was a really great um, um, part was the fact that 
it didn't cater to one group of individual people. Um, it captured millennials. I mean, it talked about, just because it's a medical expert as the author, it talked about social media such as TikTok. We all can relate. Everybody now has a TikTok, okay? Um, so I was very excited that it included um, information about social media that we're using all the time. Um, it, it, broke, it, it broke all of the, the questions, the insecurities, um, even tying in our traditions, as well as addressing things when it comes to um, our role as parents. Um, again, there were so many questions that came up, but along the way, I received every answer to a question that I had. And again, the key thing is no longer can we deny how thoroughly entangled our private family lives are with our economic lives. And again, um, no matter what hat it is that you wear, you have had that question in the back of your head. How am I making a difference in being a change maker for others? And how does it align with how I'm able to support and make change in my own home? So that was the key takeaway for me. I want the individuals that I work with and talk to to understand that this work is passionate and give yourself a pat on the back because all of you on this call are in here engaged in doing the work, but you also have family lives that are entangled and they should not be separate. And I'm just really excited. Yes, um, I saw one of the questions was in regards to how is this any different? It's not that it's any different, it's that it caters to a set of individuals that maybe haven't been spoken to before. And again, the key thing um, that I, I would like for anyone listening is to understand that um, one takeaway is the experiences we have in childhood as mediated by our parents will be reflected in much of what happens to us years later. We all can relate. So parents, educators, law enforcement, medical, I applaud you for all. finally in 2022 coming together. We're all on the same page, fighting for the same thing. And as parents and educators and adults that are all in this as a nation, I want you to do more than just survive. And this book is about telling you, hey, I want you to do more than just survive. I want you to truly live thrive and prosper continuously. So again, this book really captured my heart. Um, I'm really excited to um, see what comes of it. And again, yes, there's a lot of research and books out there, but this one is definitely for anyone who hasn't found a book that sparks that light. Thank you. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Yeah, it's definitely a book where um, you turn the page and you think, is she reading my mind? Because there's the answer to your next question or your thoughts. So thank you so much. Our other panelists are here in staff roles, um, which might give you a little bit of a different perspective on the book, um, or maybe not. So as you read the book and listen um, to Dr. Suskin and Loli, uh, Yoli talk today, what have you been thinking about in terms of how it applies to your work? Um, Jennifer, I'm gonna go to you and if you could just take a brief one to two minutes and share with us um, how you feel like that applies. Sure, and um, Samantha, oh my goodness, yes, I felt like I was uh, in this, going down memory lane and, and reading the book, uh, because you're right, you know, I'm being asked a question with my professional hat, uh, but through every example, um, through the personal story that Dr. Suskin offered of her life, um, and uh, her navigating the, the waters and the, in the, with the children in her boat and getting across the stream, um, you could feel every experience. Um, and it brought back memories uh, from my own uh, raising of my children. But from a, from a professional hat view, I think of our community-based organizations. I think of our local prevent child abuse councils, uh, many of which they provide direct services to families. And Dr. Suskin mentioned um, how the importance of focusing on the holistic uh, along for family well-being. 
Um, and with that, I, I reflect on the family-centered approach. Um, you know, and with this family-centered approach, a lot of the times we have to set, as practitioners, we have to set the expectations high because we're setting the examples of all the other fields to follow. Um, so how do we create an experience, and I think of family resource centers across the country, how do we create a feeling where caregivers feel affirmed, where they feel that they're encouraged to participate in all of the different programs and services that are available to them without the fears? Um, and in doing so, all of that work you know, requires a practitioner to delicately ask the right questions. Um, to make sure that we're uncovering the true needs of these families. Uh, and again, you know, Dr. Suskin throughout the, the book highlights um, some unique tools that have been developed um, and framed in a way that, that we can use those. Uh, but we want to make sure that those families that we're helping when we build that trust, that they also know they're safe with us. Um, you know, I think of the one example of the mom who slept with her children on the park bench and goes to the doctor the next day and had the courage to share with the doctor where she spent the last night. She felt like she was gonna be safe by sharing that with him and was not gonna, that there'd be answers, solutions, whatever provider, whatever he provided, um, you know, to be able to help her open up and, and be herself and feel safe is just so, so powerful because how can we do that everywhere? Um, and then I also think, um, when we think of our home visiting programs, when we think of uh, those that provide parenting classes, maybe Parenting 101, when I think of our social workers, when we think of our educational system, educators out there, you know, Dr. Suskin mentioned how all parents, all caregivers hold the ability to build their child's brain. I don't think I felt like I had that ability. You know, mine were raised pre internet, right? Uh, there's still the moments of going to Barnes and Nobles and scouring the shelves and finding the books on what to expect or all of those, all of those different things that one minute tells you one thing and the next and the other. But nobody talked to me about brain development. Nobody asked me those important questions um, about uh, what I was doing, those serve and return. Um, so I think, I think that piece of it is how we can incorporate uh, building the confidence of our parents and all of our caregivers, whether they're grandparents raising their grandchildren, whether they're aunts and uncles, that they have the power um, from, from birth to really support these children's brain architecture with very simple three-step process. Um, and then just separately, I'll, I'll just share this uh, in regards to Yoli's presentation today. Uh, I think back of running a small grassroots nonprofit, and I think of the cost of curriculum. I think of the cost of sending uh, professional uh, child educators out to be trained. I think of the cost of putting groups together and hearing the package that you are offering for free for anyone to be able to take this three-prong approach and, and support this, uh, this this push for this ideal of building a parent nation, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for removing all the barriers. It's so, so impressive. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing that. Deborah, what were your thoughts about how it is applying to your work? Well, I think uh, similar to Jennifer, I, I did want to mention that uh, even though I'm, I'm serving in the professional role on this panel, uh, you know, I'm also a parent and a grandparent. And so as Fatima mentioned, I saw myself in the pages. I uh, was the daughter of a single mom who, who struggled. We lived in poverty when I was growing up. Uh, I then became a single mom, but I was divorced. I was educated. I was a professional. I was divorced from a physician. So I didn't have the poverty experience that my mother had as a single mom, but I still had struggles with childcare and, and finding uh people to watch my kids when I had to work at night in, in certain uh, positions. And then uh, now I'm a grandmother to children who are my son and his wife are trying to, uh, you know, raise children during this pandemic world that we live in now. So those are all very different, but similar challenges that uh, all three generations have experienced. And then 
Uh, but as a professional, uh, what I have seen is, you know, we in partnership with Prevent Child Abuse Georgia, which uh, Jennifer represents, uh, we have developed our state's child abuse and neglect prevention plan pre-pandemic. So we went around the state in 2019 uh, into all corners of our state, developing a, a state child abuse and neglect prevention plan. And we had uh, professionals who participated in those meetings and, and responded to our surveys, but we also had parents and caregivers, faith leaders, civic leaders, et cetera, who also were engaged in the process. And what we heard all over the state were the same things, that here are the six six objectives, the 77 strategies that you can implement if you want to create family and child well-being, uh, thereby reducing child abuse and neglect, right? And so what, I, what struck me as I was reading through the book is so many of the things that were brought up all over the state of Georgia uh, were the same things that Dr. Suskin uh, identifies in the book. Uh, the, one of the six objectives is increasing access to quality, affordable early childhood education. Um, one of the um, objectives is increasing uh, family economic security. And one of the strategies under that objective is uh, increasing uh, family-friendly work policies. Um, what really struck me, and we had had Prior to, uh, you know, reading the book, uh, we had had these conversations in Georgia that so many of our strategies in our plan are related to policy. They're not programs. Uh, and what struck me in the book and what struck me last night, we had the chance to, to hear Dr. Suskin uh, talk with Prevent Child Abuse Georgia, uh, Prevent Child Abuse America about the book and, and um I can't remember if she said it or I read it, but she said you can't program your way into child well-being. That you know we can't, as a society, we can't spend enough money. <laughs> CBCAP is never going to be large enough to be able to provide programs and services for families to create child well-being for every child. But what we can do is develop policies and systems that promote child well-being. And so there wouldn't be the need for the programs and services if we had the policies and the systems that worked for the well-being uh, for children and families. So it sort of gave uh, me professionally for our state and then of course for the whole nation, it gave me the perspective that uh, you know we're on the right track uh, we know this, as, as Dr. Suskin mentioned when she first started talking, um, but now hopefully we'll get the word out to those leaders that make those decisions, uh, you know, across our country so that they'll be able to see the connection. She gave us the scientific evidence to say, this is why we need to do this for our, for our families. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you all for um, those really uh, your reflection and um, really impactful thoughts about moving forward um, from this data, from, from the science. So thank you so much. We do have just about um, 16, 17 minutes left. So I think what we should do is go to questions and answers so that we can, um, we can get those out of the way. And then if we have any time at the end, we can go back to the panel. I think that's a great approach, Maureen. Thank you. I loved everything that was shared by the panelists. Um, I know you all have great insights. And I think what we'll do is look at the questions that have come in. And uh, Dana and Yoli take the first uh, attempt at answering them, you know, the first leap at it. And then we'll see if any of the panelists want to weigh in as well. So um, I'm going to, these aren't necessarily in the order they came in, but I'm going to look at a couple of the questions here. One is um, from Celenda Perry asking, these look like national initiatives. I think she means a national sort of policy type of federal policy efforts. Do the parent villages encourage local employers and local governments to integrate parent supportive policies? Yes, yes. It's, it's really all of the above. When parents come together through their parent villages, they'll have an opportunity to explore the issues that they care about. It could be a very local issue. It could be about their employer. 
It could be about their city. It could be about their county or state. Um, and if they start to identify broad issues, like, I don't know, say paid parental leave, by the time they get to session three and four, um, they will begin to, um, they will get a handout with a national list of all the organizations in the country that are working on paid parental leave in one way or another policy program, but mostly around advocacy. And then they'll get the same handout, but for their state. And that handout actually has all the different topic areas that, that they will likely begin to identify, child care, paid parental leave, more green spaces, paternity leave. It's got, I don't know, about eight or nine different categories. And so they can then, if they are interested in addressing that issue, they now know they have somewhere to start in their state, in their community, or at a national level. They don't need to recreate an organization or they can tap those organizations to help them at their local level address that particular issue. So it's a both and. And we really didn't wanna be prescriptive. This is really around empowering parents or allowing them to take up their own power to identify the issues, the needs that they want to see change in this society by first and foremost, beginning to elevate their own expectations that they deserve that support. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of positive changes that come when a, an employer or a local municipality or state implements something and then others can see that it works and then it becomes competitive or it just becomes such a good idea that others do it or it rises up to the federal level. So it certainly doesn't need to be one or the other. Um, I'm going to uh, read off one of the other questions um, and, uh, and then we'll have chances for everybody to jump in with some responses too, I think. Um, so Christopher Brown wrote in, from a broad perspective, how does a parent village differ from similar efforts or elements of parent support groups like a parent cafe? Did you conduct research on such existing groups and determine how to create something even more effective, something that makes a parent village unique? Actually, parent cafes, Be Strong Families, were our partner. Um, they were one of our beta test groups. They brought parents and parent leaders together to um, go through all four sessions. So um, we're not we're not at all replicating what anyone is doing. Um, we actually are embracing all of these potential partners that we are providing additional tools and resources for their own toolkit to add to what they're already doing. This is why it's adaptable and modular in terms of the four sessions. Um, and that's what we learned from all the groups. Oh my God, this fits perfectly, but we didn't have the framework that this tool has around the brain science, around the neuroscience, um, or most of their advocacy or leadership or parent education efforts are less about changing society, which this is about, and more around, um, I don't know, how to engage your school system um, or a number of other efforts that is more around what you, what you necessarily need to be doing as opposed to what society needs to be doing. So it complements, and this is the feedback that we're getting, it complements a lot of what the work is already in the field adds to it, builds on it, et cetera. I don't know, Dana, if you want to add to that. Yeah, no, just uh, exact, just to um, continue with that idea, it's really, it's a framework. I mean, there are so many incredible groups around the country pushing forward. And you could just imagine if there's sort of a coalescing in whether it be the language or the framework, um, I, you know, in my research hat, I study the role of belief and belief shifts. So actually, if you look up my name in shifting beliefs, you can see how shifting beliefs actually plays into shifting of behaviors and child outcomes. So a lot of my early work is at the individual level, but at the same, in the same sort of way, when you mirror that idea of can we shift the beliefs nationwide? We all taught, we all know this is important. But I, the missing link that I see is a real, real internalization of the belief that society can and should play a role. We sort of say it, but I think like, I don't know about you all, but still you feel like, gosh, I should be doing this. And, you know, it's on me. And really, to name it and believe it. And when you hear it as a chorus, right, you've got a group of, you know, with 
parent cafe and you're like, yeah, you go through the big shift tool and you're like, whoa, there is so much on my shoulders. And it doesn't actually have to be that way. And I think in some ways, it's a permission and a belief shifting to imagine a different way um, that it could be. Because let me tell you, in other countries, there's some really fascinating research. You ask people in um, Italy and in places that have more family-friendly policies, and they talk about parental guilt and stuff, and they're like, what? Why would I feel guilty? Why isn't society supporting me more? Because I'm, I'm building society, and I see that as an important missing link. We talk about action, 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 but you, you, you have to think of, you know, have the mediators between it. So, um, so yeah, there are so many groups. We just want to be part and part of it uh, and a contributor to it. And Caitlin, just to respond to Christopher Brown, um, and I love that you're bringing in the father voice. Thank you, Christopher. One of our beta test groups was an all dads group. And we learned so much um, and tweaked our tools and our resources um, given what we learned because we know that fathers are, are as important and want to be seen as a parent, usually it's the mom. And so we wanted to make sure that all of the activities, all of the, all of the messaging is both directed both to moms and dads, as well as grandparents and aunties and neighbors and caregivers. Um, it's really the, the key message in Dana's book that you know most of us are all parents if we're caring for children. Great, thank you. I'm gonna read off one other question and we only have a few minutes until we need to get to our, our closing updates. Um, so, but I think this is something that anyone on the panel or the presenters might have an opinion to share. So David Dooley wrote in, an entirely new kind of media-based parenting education that reaches everyone everywhere could be a powerful form of primary prevention. Should public health agencies and organizations be developing this new kind of parenting education? And I think like the videos that you shared, Yoli, are a good example of media-based um, ways to reach people. And I'm just wondering if anyone wants to weigh in on that question as we wrap up here. I would just like to say that the campaigns that you're creating are strengths-based. Um, when I think of the terminology that was uh, used, the super spreader. Um, so, you know, having this common language, breaking down the misconceptions of building positive community norms. If that's the super spreader that can happen and we can all join on the bandwagon, um, it, you really can literally possibly see shifts um, and, and I can't wait to experience that shift. I hope it all feels like an earthquake in a way uh, when the awakening starts to happen. So I just, it's incredible. Thanks, Jennifer. And I know Samantha was jumping in too. I would definitely say that this book isn't a straight line approach where your entity has to start at one point and then go through a timeline in a, a straight. This is a circular approach. You jump in where your organization is needed. If you see where it fits into the work that you do, jump in and just start doing it because every organization is built on parents. We wouldn't exist if we didn't have parents that created us. So jump in where you see fit. And this is not to recreate what is already in place. This is to supplement. It can be supplemented even in the juvenile um, Department of Juvenile Justice. It can be supplemented for courtroom advocacy. Wherever you see yourself in this book or in those pages, jump in and begin because we are all parents and product of parents. Whether they stay together or not together, whether they're alive right now or not, we are all here to support each other. And the key word in the title of the book was nation. That means for us all to come together as one. So wherever you see fit to um, use the book, if you want to develop a workbook to go along with it, whatever it is, it leaves that open-ended creativity to be designed by your entity. Beautiful. I think we might wrap it up there on those powerful words and call to action from Samantha. 
thank you so much. Um, we are going to share a few more, up, a few updates from CSSP and the Alliance, but I just want to thank Dana for writing this book, uh, Yoli for all the work you're doing on the campaign, and both of you for joining us today and for our panelists. Thanks for taking an early look at the book and sharing your reactions. And Maureen, thanks for facilitating that. Um, I'm going to show my screen so we can do some updates uh, as we always share. Uh, sorry, just took a second. Um, so we're going to share just some quick updates from CSSP. Um, on our February webinar, we were talking about our perspectives on early relational health series. And so I just wanted to check back in and let you all know that all four of these sessions are now done. The fourth one will be posted, I think, tomorrow. Um, we are just making final edits on it. Um, really exciting conversations about um, early relational health and how in various uh, settings and ways we can all promote early relational health. So I really encourage you to check that out. The final one um, features um, Dana Long from the UCSF uh, Center for Child and Community Health and uh, community health worker Nye Farn and Jerome Trailer, who's a parent who attends their clinic with his young kids and the conversation is really fantastic. So I hope you'll all check those out. <clears throat> A couple more updates from CSSP. Um, tax deadline is approaching. If you are working directly with parents who haven't yet filed their taxes, um, especially if they didn't get their partial child tax credits throughout the year last year, uh, please encourage them to do so. There are flyers um, that you can download in English and Spanish to distribute and the deadline is Monday. So um, reach out to any parents that you're working with who haven't or might not have done that yet. Um, just a note, CSSP is hiring. We have three positions posted right now. There actually are some others in the works, so keep an eye on that if you'd be interested in joining us at CSSP. Some of them are based in our DC office, some of them are remote, so keep an eye on those. And I wanted to mention the Save the Date for the Together for Families conference, which will be in October. It's going to be virtual again, October 19th to 21st, and we're actually doing a virtual kickoff on May 19th. That, those details will be coming soon, but you can mark your calendar now. It'll be a fun way to get a sneak preview of what's happening at the conference, share some input on what's going to happen at the conference, and just start connecting with folks in advance. So keep an eye out for that, and I hope you'll all join us at the conference in October. And I'll hand off to Maureen to share some updates from the Alliance. Thank you so much. So nice to see um, lots of familiar names on here. I'm Maureen Holliker. I'm with the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. I'm the National Training Director. And our, um, our first update for you is that our, um, I see lots of Alliance certified trainers here, so that's exciting. We, um, our May training of trainers is full. And so we have opened a new session in August. So August 22nd to the 25th, um, training of trainers. There is a link here um, with a QR code. Uh, I can put that in the chat also. So if you are interested in becoming an Alliance Certified Trainer in the Protective Factors Framework, um, reach out to us or if you know any colleagues that you think would be. And then our next update is um, about our Alliance National Parent Partnership. Um, who puts together um, resources all throughout the year, but especially for Child Abuse Prevention Month every April. And um, all of these materials that are put together are by parents for parents. And um, you can find those on ctfalliance.org um, and just click on the parent voice button. I can put that in the chat box. Um, but you will find lots of materials that you can use on social media. There are communication kits that you can download. Um, and so just a, a huge amount of material and that has just been updated on our website. And then just one more, um, pleased to announce the Alliance's eighth annual Birth Parent National Network, uh, BPNN. Virtual convening is scheduled on Thursday, June 23rd from 10 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific time um, and the other time zones are here. We're going to be talking about racism and anti-racism in the social ecology. Many of you may have seen um, Kaylin and Dr. Brown's uh, presentation on this in an earlier uh, Strengthening Families call. So. Um, 
if you would like more information about that or you feel like somebody else um, should definitely see that presentation, uh, this would be a great place to do that. Great, thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you once again to our presenters and panelists and all our engaged participants. This has been fantastic. I feel like the hour and a half just flew by. We could have had